The European theater of the Great War is by far the most well-known, and understandably so. Given that it was the primary theater of the conflict, but Europe certainly wasn't the only continent that saw action as a consequence of the so-called World War. An often overlooked theater which happened to include a then modern imperialist power and an old great power of the sphere was Asia. The dynamic in Asia at the time of the war was turbulent. Following the collapse of the Qing dynasty in 1912, China had become a chaotic mess of entities vying for power or independence. Japan, in contrast, was a recently industrialized and rising imperial power that sought to assert itself in the Far East at the expense of the European empires who began setting up shop in the region and of course China itself. Despite this underlying tension between Japan and China, both countries wound up on the side of the Triple Entente by the end of the war. When it would have seemed that one or the other should have taken the opposition side for the sake of security or to support their territorial claims. But of course, that's not what ended up happening. To understand why, we first need a grasp of Asian geopolitics of the day, and that starts with knowing their history. The Qing were a Manchu-led conquest dynasty that had ruled China since the early 1600s after defeating the Han-led Ming dynasty. For those of you who don't know, the Han are the dominant ethnic group of China proper, while the Manchu were a Mongol-related group from the northeast. Under the Qing, China reached a new territorial height, and for a time, stood as the largest economy on the planet, surpassing that of Western Europe combined. The Qing, however, were developmentally very stagnant. The nature of China's geography made the country relatively secure from outside threats. To the north was arid deserts, to the south was dense jungles, to the west were perilous mountains, and to the east was the Pacific Ocean. Understandably, this left China with little competition, and with little competition comes little pressure to improve. The European powers, in contrast, constantly in an arms race against one another, were developing rapidly and soon surpassed the Chinese giant to the point of being able to project their influence into what was once China's sphere. The Japanese were in a comparable position. Roughly around the same time the Manchu came to power in China, Japan had adopted a policy of Sakoku to restrict the imposing influences of Portugal and Spain upon Japan. What this policy meant was that Japan took measures to aggressively restrict its interaction with foreign powers, though Japan still absorbed small amounts of Western culture through their Dutch connections in the trade gateway of Nagasaki. China is often thought of as having remained open to the world while Japan embraced isolationism, but in reality China had taken on the policy well before Japan. The difference in appearance being that China had a massive export market, whereas Japan did not, but both still refused to import much from the outside world. Come 1853, Japan was forced to open itself up to the West, but almost immediately set about adopting Western technology and practices in order to compete as an equal in geopolitics of the day. China, in contrast, resisted fully opening up and attempted to cling to its old ways, but saw its economic and political sovereignty gradually chipped away beginning with the end of the First Opium War in 1842, up to the Boxer Protocols of 1901 which followed the Boxer Rebellion. Scholars generally agree that China would not begin effectively industrializing until the 1950s, though there were efforts to adopt Western technology as early as 1861 with the self-strengthening movement. China's westernization was poorly managed, obfuscated by outdated and corrupt Chinese bureaucracy, and Western understanding was never fully embraced as it was by Japan. China wanted to produce Western technology, possess Western-style weapons, and continue to advance at a pace at least matching the Western powers, but refused to adapt its political structure and traditional lifestyle to the demands of this. The product ultimately being a cheap hollow emulation of modernization with none of the substance or function. Western powers who once sought to support Chinese development came to view China as a lost cause, and essentially a clueless customer who would pay for more advisors and infrastructure even if it wasn't effective. By 1910, China had experienced repeated humiliation via the infringement of its sovereignty at the hands of the European powers, faced a destabilizing and catastrophic 14-year civil war that cost 20 million lives, was forced to realize that it had been outshined by Japan in the Sino-Japanese War and in the arms race for technological modernization, and of course saw Qing legitimacy crumble while the decentralized nature of the empire paved the way for disunity and war. In 1908, the emperor would suddenly die, believed to be poisoned, and a two-year-old became his successor. Revolution broke out in 1911 and in February of 1912, the Chinese Empire had officially come to an end. When the Great War broke out, China was experiencing a crisis of leadership and organization, desperately trying to consolidate a functional modern state. Japan, on the other hand, was doing fine and had entered the war early on in honor of its alliance with Britain, using this conflict as an excuse to conquer German holdings in China and in the Pacific to expand its own imperial realm. The gist most people know is that not much else happens after that. China is still chaotic, briefly becoming an empire again from 1915 to 1916. Various regional warlords emerge in response to efforts at centralization, and an attempted coup blamed on the Germans is used as a pretext to finally join the war in 1917. 
The Chinese actually just wanting an opportunity to contest Japan's claims on former German colonies in China once peace negotiations came. The war ends with Japan and China having fought on the same side, but what if that changed? What if in an alternate timeline, China joined the Central Powers? Now before we go any further, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsor, War Thunder. In case you haven't heard of it, War Thunder is the most comprehensive free-to-play vehicular combat game ever made. Play multiplayer matches using 2,000 incredibly detailed tanks, airplanes, helicopters, and ships in dynamic PvP matches on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. Making use of multiple immersion levels, there are a variety of playstyles to suit your desires, along with an in-depth customization system to make your vehicle your own. I'm personally a big fan of the detail that went into crafting the vehicles and environments. Even the damage sustained by the vehicle is impressively detailed to where you see actual effects on the vehicle's performance based on where it was hit. Follow the link in the description to get a free bonus pack at sign up, including multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and much more. Now, back to the video. The timeline of events in Asia between the outbreak of the Great War and its conclusion aren't as simple as they seem. By early November of 1914, Japan had already captured Germany's holdings in the Shandong Peninsula in the only major Asian land battle of the war, and despite the wishes of China, Japan intended on holding onto them. In January of the following year, Japan issued to China, then still a republic under the presidency of Yuan Shikai, a list of 21 demands. These demands widely expanded Japan's sphere of influence in northern China and imposed upon the rest of the Chinese Republic a series of conditions which would have left them an essential protectorate of the Japanese Empire, including Japanese imposed restrictions on China's foreign dealings and the need to appoint Japanese advisors who would be placed in charge of Chinese economics, law enforcement, and infrastructure. China, of course, wasn't eager to concede to these demands, and despite their secretive nature, leaked them to the European powers in hopes of provoking some sort of political intervention. Japan did eventually concede some of its demands, but would retain a lingering desire for control over China which would carry over into World War II. But what if things went differently? What if China, instead of seeking assistance from the Entente who were allied to Japan, assumed it could not count on these countries who already held their own ambitions upon China and may even support Japan? Let's suppose that is in fact the outcome, and China's calls for help are dismissed by the Entente, leaving China at the full mercy of Japan. Perhaps then the Chinese might turn to Germany and the Central Powers in a desperate last-ditch hope that they might receive some support, or if nothing else, a stronger position from which to negotiate a return of their lands post-war. Realistically, Chinese leadership had more of an inclination toward the Entente powers by this point in time, but beyond anything else, held its own interest in mind, and if working with Germany could help them retain their independence from Japan. That was the measure they were willing to take. And the Germans had in fact prepared a concession of their Chinese holdings back to China upon the outbreak of the war, just for the purpose of denying them to the Allies, demonstrating a sense of German pragmatism toward this sphere if it could be utilized to not necessarily an advantage, but to deny an advantage to the Abtalt. Germany recognizes that there is little the Chinese can do to directly impact the war in Europe and that this would become an almost entirely isolated conflict between China and Japan. But by then having lost their last holdings in the Pacific, and realizing that this might put some strain upon France and Britain's navies and foreign soldiers, given the close proximity of both British India and French Indochina, Germany would agree to accept China into the Central Powers, thus beginning the Second Sino-Japanese War. Now the implications of this for China are actually pretty interesting. Firstly, Shikai now has a single rallying point with which to unite a greater majority of China, and through this, establish a more centralized war government. The key word there is majority because not all of China would support the increasingly centralized government, nor the war itself. The pressure of this conflict would almost certainly drive divides between Shikai and some of his generals, but more on that in a bit. Now if Shikai were to use the war as a justification to increase the strength of the central government, we're left wondering whether or not he would still attempt to establish a new empire. In our timeline preparations had already been underway by the time China would have joined the Central Powers in this alternate timeline, but given the higher stakes of the war, it's questionable if pushing forward such a bold public change of government during wartime would be a wise approach. If Shikai was sensible, he would avoid publicly reorganizing the state into a monarchy and retain the republic, but gradually curtail its institutions to establish a modern dictatorship, much like that which was later established under Chiang Kai-shek. As a central power, China would be forced to contend with Japan in the Shandong region, as well as along the coast. The Japanese would probably be elated to have a just cause to push further into Chinese land and carve out a greater prize for themselves, but the cost of this conflict in terms of lives would be enormous. The Second Sino-Japanese War of our timeline was both devastating in damage and brutal in its degree of violence, and though there would be something of a technological gap between that version of the war and this one, the results would no doubt be similarly catastrophic for China especially. 
Territorially, China could expect significant losses in the northeast, including Manchuria, Shaanxi, and Shandong. Where anti-establishment pro-Japanese forces existed, along with the lower eastern coast, strongholds for what would have later become the Inhui Shaanxi and Fengtan cliques, and the Kuomintang. The remaining cliques were largely anti-monarchical, and likely would have remained loyal so long as Shikai didn't attempt to reinstitute imperial governance. That being said, minor uprisings, clashes, and disputes between smaller warlords could also be expected, but the only rebellious groups which would pose a threat to Shikai's government would be the northeastern and south coastal cliques likely to defect to Japan's side. Unfortunately, given China's state, their involvement in the war would do little to change its overall outcome, and with the eventual defeat of the Central Powers, China would lose its sole bargaining chip against Japan. Hoping to use the conflict to secure their territory and sovereignty from the Japanese, China would only end up losing much more in the process. Northeastern lands from Manchuria to Shandong would be annexed by Japan. East Turkestan, much like the ethnically distinct regions of the Austrian and Turkish empires, would be granted independence from China proper. Shikai would be removed from power and either executed or forced into exile, and what remained of China would be placed under the rule of a closely monitored and puppeted Kuomintang led by Sun Yat-sen. Very early on Japan was already developing a plan for Pan-Asianism, an effort to assert Asian independence and self-sufficiency from the Western world. These ideas were popular among Chinese anti-monarchists, many of whom had themselves studied in Japan for a time, and this would have formed the basis of Japan's relationship with this new Chinese government. Upon Sun's passing, and just as in our timeline, succession would be contested by Chiang Kai-shek and Wang Jinwei, with the Japanese now having a hand in choosing China's new leader. It wouldn't be an easy call. On one hand, Jinwei was seen by many as too sympathetic to left-wing ideals, including communism. Despite a personal opposition to the ideology, he had initially sought cooperation between the right and left to aid in Chinese unification. Shek on the other hand was fiercely anti-communist, but was far more pro-Western than Jinwei. Shek had, earlier in his life, served in the Japanese armed forces, possibly earning him greater credibility with the Japanese, but in our timeline Jinwei would actually go on to lead a Japanese puppet state, suggesting the Japanese had seen potential in him. Given the fact that Chiang had come out the winner of this competition in our timeline, his youth possibly making him appear more persuadable to the Japanese, and his prior service to Japan, we'll assume he has chosen to serve as China's new head of state. Post-war China under Japan's vigilance is far more stable than in our world. Unlike the Beiyang government of Yuan Shikai which struggled to assert control over the country on account of the military's decentralized nature, the Kuomintang was heavily centralized and as per Sun's own beliefs, sought to uniting China through military force, military force which would now be bolstered by Japan's own modern, centralized, and well-regimented military. The warlord era, never quite occurring on the scale of our world without Shikai's attempted re-establishing of the empire, leaves far fewer adversaries for Chiang to subdue, allowing him to eliminate rebellious factions within China, including the communists. Chiang's notoriously anti-communist stance would lead him to purge suspected communist activists, while Japanese leadership organized assassinations of regional authorities deemed too independent, all in the name of securing central authority and preparing China for modernization. The country would settle, and Japan would begin making full use of its new sphere of influence. Like Korea and Taiwan during their early phases of colonization, China would face a continuation of unequal treatment as was faced under the Western powers during the Qing Dynasty. Japanese citizens would be allowed to settle within China and be afforded extraterritorial rights within the country. The government, although officially independent, would be saturated with Japanese advisors and vice officials who would hold the majority of authority. That's not to say China wouldn't benefit from this, however. As with many of Japan's colonies, China would experience massive internal development, industrialization, and economic growth, but this economic growth would come with the underlying purpose of benefiting Japan first. Japan would take to exploiting Chinese natural resources, redistribute large swaths of Chinese-owned land to Japanese settlers, enact preferential trade arrangements which allowed it to purchase Chinese manufactured goods at low prices, and may have even forced China to utilize its own currency in the pursuit of a yen zone to compete with the influence of Britain's pound sterling and the American dollar. Japanese established schools in China would almost certainly teach a pro-Japanese curriculum, including encouraging the speaking of the Japanese language on the mainland. All the while news media would be tightly controlled, with major new paper companies being seized or bought up by the Japanese. To add insult to injury, Korean manufactured opium backed and transported by Japan would eventually find its way into China, leaving many to feel that China's century of humiliation had simply been restarted under a new master. Chiang Kai-shek would not have been satisfied with this outcome. It cannot be overstated just how much of a Chinese nationalist Shek was. While many within China were willing to tolerate Japanese dominance in the name of Pan-Asianism, or to re-embrace Manchu rule for the sake of monarchy, Shek was not. 
Sheck envisioned a fully sovereign hand-led nationalist Chinese republic that would stand as the leader of Asia, and was willing to utilize any means necessary to achieve that, thus his collaboration with the communists in our timeline, and his later collaboration with the European powers. Sheck would stand firm but diplomatic in Japanese efforts to curtail his own influence, allowing him to maintain control and loyalty over the national army, while not provoking a removal by Japan. Once China had sufficiently developed, and it was felt that the burdens of this partnership with Japan outweighed the benefits, Sheck would press for de-Japanization. This would likely begin in 1926 when, just as in our timeline, Weimar Germany sought to rekindle its partnership with China and assist in their development, something Japan would restrict and seek to shut down in this alternate timeline, but which Sheck would encourage in an effort to keep China's options open and not leave the country totally dependent upon Japan. One of Sheck's ministers, Zhu Jiehu and German staff officer Max Bauer would be the chief architects of this partnership, and with Sheck's protection, circumvent Japanese restrictions on foreign assistance. Though Bauer would pass away shortly after, Germany's investment in China as a sovereign power had begun, angering the Japanese, and initiating a cooling of relations between Japan and the Kuomintang. Japan would be forced to reconsider its approach to China, who by the mid-1930s would have become a formidable power, and arguably an equal in strength. Though Japan still remained dominant navally, China's land army had arguably become superior, especially following increased investment upon the ascension of Chancellor Adolf Hitler in Germany and the Germans' own remilitarization. Bauer's former position as advisor to Scheck would be filled by Alexander von Falkenhausen, who took to instituting Wehrmacht-level standards in the Chinese army and encouraged the development of numerous fortifications specifically designed to protect against the Japanese navy. Japan retained a firm grasp over Korea, Inner Mongolia, Manchuria, and Shandong, but it was clear that China had grown beyond its control. Loyalty to Chang remained strong, especially as he built a cult of personality around himself and already eradicated internal threats to his rule. The Japanese could invest in a military subjugation of China or embrace them as a co-equal within the now solidifying concept of an East Asian co-prosperity sphere. The issue, however, was Japan's continued occupation of what Chang recognized as integrally Chinese lands. Manchuria and Inner Mongolia may have been negotiable, but the recovery of Shandong and Shaanxi were clearly in Chang's sight. To top this all off was the establishment of the anti commodern Pact in 1936, of which both China and Japan were to become members, both seen as allies of Germany against the threat of international communism. In our timeline, the invasion of Manchuria, an outbreak of war between Japan and China had prevented both countries from becoming members of the bloc, but such would not be the case in this timeline, bringing these two countries standing upon a shaky peace to contemplate their future. China had grown much closer to Germany than Japan would have in this timeline, though the Japanese would still assert that they were the superior nation of Asia. Japan appeared far more dedicated to containing and combating the Soviet Union than China did, given Chang's past collaboration with the communists, but Japan had also once stood as a loyal ally of Britain. There is no question that inevitably, Chang would seek to retake Shandong and Shaanxi from Japan, though this need not happen militarily. It's possible that as a sign of goodwill and in an effort to preserve the co-prosperity sphere, Japan would cede these lands back to China in exchange for the formal establishment of a union between the countries as equals. This may prove sufficient enough to topple the Soviets and weaken the British through an intervention in India that the Axis ultimately emerge victorious. It is also possible that China takes Japan's spot in the Axis powers and proceeds to war against them for a reconquest of all its lost lands, and to assume a position as the dominant power of Asia. Depending on what becomes of Japan, this could either see China remain in control of Asia post-war given the unlikelihood that it would provoke war with the US or Britain, or see the Chinese fractured and partitioned if Japan decided to join the Allies and conquer China alongside the Soviet Union. On the other hand, it's also possible that Germany continues to see Japan as the superior power and allies with them over China just as in our timeline, but with the Chinese far more capable this time around, would see a much swifter defeat for the Japanese than in our world. Whatever the outcome, China's involvement in the First Great War would have been an initial disaster, but from that destruction the country would emerge much stronger and better united come the Second World War, and assuring them a stronger position in a majority of possible outcomes. Once again, let's thank War Thunder for sponsoring today's video. Follow the link in the description to get a bonus of multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and much more.